Before I started on the course, I just wanted to take you down history. And show you how things have evolved. OK. So later on. OK, so this is uh, informal lectures with a lot of pretty pictures, OK, which will uh, take you down through my version of how uh, automatons have evolved. So <clears throat> now, this is not recent history. Right? We start at around about 1770. Okay, where clockwork mechanisms were made. Okay, so the picture on the top, you can see a bird. And this bird would chirp, flap wings, dance around. Okay. And these kind of clockwork mechanisms were made in very large numbers. I mean, large enough numbers. And specifically, if there are people from Hyderabad, or you've gone to Hyderabad and seen the Salajang Museum, Right, you would have seen they have a drummer, which is there. Okay, and at 12 o'clock, the drummer comes out. He actually marches out of a um, room and then beats the drum 12 times and goes back in. So if you go back to Hyderabad, make it a point of going and seeing this. Okay. So in history, so these are going back now 300 years, 250 years, right? That you see imitation of what we call lifelike motion. Okay, and so these were implemented using cams and uh, gears. You can see them, and then you have this whistle, standing waves in piston, which you study in class nine, cams and gears, which you do in class second year, some places third year. So that's the implementation. Okay, so theoretically, you should be able to make devices like this already without doing robotics. Then, well, I'll keep going back and forth because uh, not all the evaluation is, uh, uh, or evolution is uh, sequential like this. So this gentleman called Vukasin, he made a flute player, which was displayed in Paris in 1738. Okay, this is historical. Now, this is a little bit of a change because this is a three-dimensional cam implementation. Okay, so you can see the conical thing which is there, somewhere in here. So you have a conical cam with surfaces on it. So this moves, this set of reeds which goes over the pulley and then essentially there's a crankshaft to basically pump air into the organs. Okay, so the flute was a fake. Okay, the flute didn't make a noise, it was basically made from organ. And then you just pumped it and change the which keys get pressed, depending on the cam. Okay, so now you have to remember that when you're talking about 1738, you did not even have the conventional lathe machine as you know it today. In fact, there is something called a Vukasin lathe. So he was one of the people who kind of early uh, automation people. And then 1805 in London, they had a great technological exhibition in which this Millard Dets automation was displayed. Okay. It could write poetry. You press a button, give it a sheet of paper, pink, it would write poetry. And would sketch ships. It would do a sketch also. Press a different button, it will sketch a ship sailing in the seas and things like that. So we are looking at 200 years ago. Okay. And, but that's not all. Then this was lost in history, right? In the 1920s in Philadelphia in the US, there is a very good technological museum. I mean, top class. At the basement, the curator found a box, which seemed to be like, you know, a bunch of spring shafts, cams connected together. So he started looking at the box and then started putting it together. So finally, you know, you understand this piece goes here, fitted parts, and it's all handmade. So it, it's not, you know, you didn't have you know, six bearings of the same size. So kind of put everything together and finally cranked it and then it started doing something and then it essentially wrote the poetry and then when it was signing, it signed Ori Miladet. 
Okay, so then the curator realized that this is the Milardet's automation which has been lost. So this is interesting, right? It's lost. Hundred years later, it can be reassembled. So unique assembly and all this stuff which is taught to you when you do production. So it's reassemblable hundred years ago without a manual. Okay, yes, by a smart guy, not your mechanic on the street, but it works. Okay. So the important question then is, if Milardet could do this in 1805, right, make something like this, can you make something like this? That's the question, right? In the IIT, graduating this year, next year, top class education, brilliant minds, if I tell you, okay, make something like this, one year's time, will you, you think you'll be able to do this? You should be able to do this, right? <laughs> so what has happened in 200 years? Well, I can at least tell you that there will be at least be maybe 10 people in the country who, should, who would be able to do this. If you give them one year and say, okay, here's your budget, one year you do this, there will be at least 1,000 people or maybe 2,000 people worldwide who can do this in one year. If you give them money and say, okay, you need to do this. But essentially in this, you know, 200 years after Milardet, so Milardet was an artist, he was a craftsman, he was a scientist, right? So the 200 years after that, mathematicians got into the act and systematically and systematically what has been worked on is what are the process, what are the equations so that this process can be taught. Consequently, when we do the course in mechanisms, we are able to teach you synthesis of four bars, we are able to teach you synthesis of camps, and you know all about gears, conjugate profiles and involute profiles and everything. So all of this has happened after these people build these things. So it's a process by which you convert what is an art into what is a science. So that is what has happened. It's largely happened over between say 1805 and 1900s. I mean beginning of the century, of the previous century. <clears throat> and then we start on what is called the robot generation. So in 1921, you had this book, R U R Rusum's Universal Robota by Karl Kapek. I guess some of you at least must be knowing about it. There's a story in which the robots kill everybody, right? That doesn't work very well. So then in the 50s, Asimov wrote iRobot. The important part is it had the three laws of robotics in which the robot will not harm human beings, will not harm himself, will carry out the task. And so theoretically he put it, put together a machine which is safe. So before that people were slightly uh, uh, concerned about uh, what these automated, automation devices would do. And it's interesting because the word robota uh, originally in the language means uh, provider of essential services, okay? So your milkman, your postman, okay, they are provider of essential services, okay? And it was never envisaged that uh, robots would one day replace quote unquote higher mental activities of human beings. That the word, it is, it is not incorporated in the word itself. So it's a little different. Then the next significant milestone according to me is 1952, the NC machine being built at MIT. So they build a um, NC lathe in which you could write a program and it would turn a piece. Now before that, this was supposed to be a highly evolved human skill to be able to use these machines and you know, get shapes, measure and find out what is there and then you know, give a little bit additional feed and things like that. And then in 1956, the first robotics company was founded by Engelberger, Unimation. Okay. And 1962, the first modern day manipulator was installed in the working plant in General Motors. 
it was a conventional and now a conventional six axis what we call a industrial manipulator so you can look at these so there is this this whole turret rotates about the base so there is this axis then this one rotates about this axis this is the translating axis and then there are these three axis at the wrist there is rotation about this axis the rotation about this axis and then a third rotation about this axis so you get six degrees of freedom and in the space there are six degrees of freedom three rotation and three translation so this could achieve any orientation and any position within the workspace 1962 okay and this is working installed in a plant in the us then people look at different configurations okay so here i have removed the wrist from the picture so you are looking at because in the wrist you know that you have got to do this orientation bit so you will always have three rotating axes and now technology is such that you can make them coincident also okay it's not so much of a problem so you have something similar to your existing wrist so now then you get the issue of positioning the wrist somewhere in space at any location that you are interested in so you want essentially for it to go to three locations x y and z so the simplest scheme possible obviously is that you have 1 2 and 3 translating joints so then obviously if you want to go up in z you say okay you go up in z you want to go along the x you say go along x you want to go along y you say go along y and then you get the end effector to be the wrist position to be position where you want to you can do the same thing you can eliminate one of the translating axis and then you get a revolute joint rotating here and then you have two translating ones so this is called a cartesian system right this is a cartesian x y z what is this kind of a system called cylindrical, cylindrical. obvious variation next you will have a, a spherical where you have one radius and then uh, and then finally you have this system where you get the same thing by three rotations okay now in going from here to here you have obvious mechanical advantages in design right because guides are always a problem straight line guides because you have to clean them you have to maintain them you have to cover them from dust sealed ball bearings are easy they are very cheap they are very easy plus uh, motors are very nice also linear motion is a problem you usually do a motor and a ball screw or you do a motor and a power screw power screw has backlash ball screw is less but expensive noisy all kinds of problems so it's always nice to have revolute joints the complication is that if you have rotary joints and you have this configuration which we are talking about here then if i want to have x y z i need to compute what this angle will be what this angle will be and what this angle will be which a little bit of mathematics not too much little bit right because well you know that this is a plane so you can first identify the plane and then you have to do just inverse kinematics on two axes we'll talk about that later and in fact you already know after 211 how to do this <clears throat> so that is the complication going through an um, mechanical simplicity maintainability as opposed to mathematical problem but currently you don't worry about it don't worry about the mathematics because you just have to do couple of inverse sines and cosines which in today's computers even microprocessors is trivial so nobody makes um, robots like this except if you want to use them in the ic industry the big advantage in the ic industry is that everything is clean so you're not worried about lubricating guides and guides jamming and sticking because everything is clean so you can just operate using there so sometimes it is nice to have it in this configuration especially if you can come from the top which you can which you cannot do if you are using the revolute one because then there is a hodgepodge of motions now <clears throat> so roughly by about 1970s what we have done is it's we have perfected the so called industrial manipulator already or we are able to get very good quality industrial manipulators 
Starting from Unimation, there's a bunch of companies. There is, you know, ASEA, there is Cincinnati, Melacron, uh, all kinds of uh, people started making robots, the Japanese, Germans. So everybody had robots in place, started putting it into plants, start using it for spray painting and things like this. So now, universe, universities turn around and say, now what do we do? Right, what do we do? Next. So till this, you know, area before this is what is there in a very basic course in robotics. You know, this is what you learn, how to handle the, just the manipulator. Forward kinematics, inverse kinematics, how to design it, how to interface encoders to motors. But we have to go much more than that. And then we start talking about the so-called AI paradigms. So we ask this question, how do we get machines to do what humans now do better? That's the important question. And what do they do better? We handle unpredictable events in an unstructured environment much better. What is the unpredictable event? I turn up on Tuesday and tell you next class is in MS 901. Right? So please attend the lecture. Now where is MS 901? I tell you it's somewhere up there in the multi-story building and I leave you at that. You come here and you see here you have cushioned seats, right? <laughs> and a clean room, right? Unlike your hostels and your other classrooms and your <laughs> So this is unstructured environment, right? It's not an environment in which you're familiar. I also walk in here and I see the room has changed completely. See, but I'm still able to take a lecture in this class, right? I've hooked up a laptop. I say, expect there'll be a cable here. And you know what, what is the protocol. So we are functioning in this, you know, unknown environment. So this is a fantastic ability, which is still not very much there in machines. Okay, so that's one of them. Learning. Okay, obvious, right? You're all students and we are all learning. Then planning and problem solving. Okay, so you planned. Some of you planned, some of you did not plan. Some of you planned 901, so I need to start early. Right, I need to give myself at least 10 minutes because as I go up, there will be people coming down the stairs. Some didn't plan and you turned up 50, 10 minutes late. Okay, so planning and problem solving and then there is inference. Answers in the absence of complete information, all linked. Where is MS901? Do I turn left at the stairs? Do I turn right at the stairs? Right? You don't know. A doctor. A doctor really does not know whether, um, you know, you have um, a problem in your pancreas, right? But really, you can say, surmise, look at, you know, blood sugar levels, look at your health level and say, okay, you have a problem. You go through with this diagnosis and then you go through with this treatment, right? You're healed. So, we are able to give answers in the absence of complete information and operate with them and solve things. And then the research, where is this material? Is it my room? Have I left it in my friend's room? In this book, where is this? material, where is this specific thing covered. And then finally, there is vision, which actually is a very rich source of information to us human beings. Okay, everything comes through vision, practically. We read, we do many things. And so vision actually uses many of the things which, have this, which has been listed here. Okay? But it is so rich and the area has become so important in AI that I have just listed it separately. Okay, and it has evolved its own kind of systems. So now, with this in mind, we have completely new kind of research which emerges. <coughs> so, there is a shaky which was put together. So this photograph is from 1970 as you can see. And it is the, touted as the first robot with intelligence. Okay, what is the level of intelligence? So there was this nice clean room and you had multicolored blocks. So you could tell the robot that, okay, you stack green, blue, red in that corner of the room. So it would go look for the green one, pick it up, put it in some corner. Okay, 
so on and so forth and then stack it. So it was intelligent, it could do this, okay. As opposed to saying ki there is a block which is kept in this corner, one block which is kept in that corner, one block which is kept in that corner, you take all of them and put them in this corner. So that's a fixed set problem. But here you could change the colors, keep them in different parts of the room and it would operate. So there's an interesting one in history. There's a thing called Lunokhod 1. So 1970, Russians sent something to the moon and it had crashed there. The West found out much later that they had tried doing it. And you know this thing, right, from here and there that uh, the Russians still today maintain that you cannot send somebody out to space, a human being. And they, that's why they never send anybody out to the moon. They believe that once you leave a certain region of the atmosphere, radiation will kill you. And there's no shielding which is possible. So, anyway, now coming back to this. <clears throat> so that's why the Russians sent Luna code. They didn't send people there to the moon. So 1970, this machine called the ODEX was built to service nuclear reactors. So you can see that um, you have these legs, so there are, it kind of walks like a spider. And you can straighten these legs. Um, so firstly, you can lengthen them to make it a long profile. And then you can slip it in through a hatch into the nuclear area. Once there, it would straighten up and it would walk around. Uh, it would walk around in these areas using the legs and then you can straighten the legs and you can press buttons and operate a, a control panel. Okay, and you can see this, uh, this resemblance and if you have made, if you watch some uh, science fiction movies made in the 70s and 80s, they have an airy resemblance to this device. You know, they'll show Martian with transparent heads and things like that. So in the 70s, they also tried to put together the, actually I shouldn't say 1970, but 70s, the OSU hexapod. Now, <coughs> so you can see that this has this legs, which are here. Now this was the first autonomous vehicle in the sense that you could tell this robot that, okay, you are here, you go from this location to that location. So it would decide whether it wanted to go here, whether it wanted to climb the table, whether it wanted to go along the uh, aisle, or it wanted to climb over the desks. So these decisions it would make on its own. It would decide where to place the legs. So all of this was automatic. So it was an autonomous vehicle, because you could just give it direction and it would go. You didn't have to do micro planning for this. And it was the first vehicle to use computation of dynamics in the algorithm processes. So before this, things were largely static processes. And then another significant change, 1975 one-legged hopping machine built by Rybert. Um, that time he was at the Carnegie Mellon University, he later moved to MIT and then moved out. Uh, so this is based on what is called the pogo stick concept, right? So you hop on a single leg with a spring. And uh, so it had hydraulic actuators, it had uh, onboard gyros, and it used a computer roughly the size of this room to control uh, this robot those days, okay? And it is essentially an inverted pendulum in the sense, what is an inverted pendulum? A pendulum is uh, attached at the top and swings like this. If you want to balance a stick, what do you do? You want to keep the tip fixed, so you move the base. Okay, so that's an inverted pendulum. So this used these kind of concepts. And what it did is, it would jump up and then it would figure out what is its state. Based on that, it would decide that this is how I want to place my leg, either forward or backward or to the left or to the right. Right, so in the next jump, based on that, it would come down and this interaction with the ground was completely passive. That means it's completely determined by the spring. So whatever it had to do, it did while it was in the air. Then it landed, it interacted, it went off again and then it did its calculation and then decided what it would do next. Significantly, 
this is a dynamically controlled machine. It's like you're standing. When you're standing, you're perennially shifting weight between your legs. So you're not statically stable. Your ratios change, but when you're sitting, you're mostly, you're mostly statically stable. Because you have large enough surface areas to support yourself on. <clears throat> and then 86, Ohio State, they build this thing called the Adaptive Suspension Vehicle. It is completely self-contained, has a, had a motorcycle engine, about 1000 cc engine. And it had um, significant uh, technological advances. It had a thing called pantograph legs, which conserved uh, hydraulic uh, power. And they had, they had system by which, you know, when one leg was pressing down, other was lifting, so the hydraulic compensated each other and you pump back fluid forces and things like that to make it manageable. So a lot of technology went into it. Each foot was, foot was force controlled. So it could walk on stone, swamp, soft ground, hard ground. So it could go through all these things. It had seven, eighty, eighty-six, if I remember right, computers, and then one for each leg and one for the overall coordination. It had more code than in the space shuttle. Okay, just to tell you the difficulty of walking and doing this kind of activity. Space shuttle is an easy problem. It's a technology problem, yes, but in different ways. Not in terms of AI. Okay. So, it needed more code than the space shuttle. It had uh, this uh, um, a forward ranging uh, laser scanner so that you can make 3D images and you can plan your, plan your path. And this was obviously autonomous. So, you just told it go there, it would go. Yeah? Yeah, there's a person sitting there. He just says that. He says, okay, go right, go left. Okay, so it's there. But it'll go. Where we wanted the person didn't be there. This could have been controlled from outside. And but wireless was not a very strong technology those days. Wireless emerged roughly a decade later. So communication would have been a problem, but they did have some communication. So essentially by that time, what you're looking at is that you're able to make a machine which can go anywhere. Right, so one of the locomotion problem is solved. The human beings can go anywhere, so you make a machine which can go anywhere. That is done. So then people started looking at smaller and smaller things. Now what do you do in smaller things? So <clears throat> let's look at a visualization, okay. So here is this walking machine, like the adaptive suspension vehicle walking on the earth. So here is my machine, here is the earth. Now I keep shrinking the machine, sorry, I keep enlarging the machine, I keep shrinking the earth, right? What does it happen after some time? The machine is large, so my machine has become large, the earth has become small. So it becomes a grasping problem. So they are very similar problems, okay? And this is a classic example. So you make this little pneumatic powered device, so you just have this, uh, rubber legs and they have three chambers in them in which you can increase the pressure. Okay, so it's a three chambered cross section and then by changing pressure, so if you increase the pressure in the top chamber, it will bend down. If you increase it in the right chamber, left chamber, so you can make it basically make it go in three directions so you can make it go anywhere. So you take this, so theoretically you can make this, I mean you can demonstrate either grasping a small object or you can demonstrate walking on a fingertip. Okay. So adaptation technology looking at smaller and smaller systems started evolving parallel manipulators okay. which you talked about where you essentially have six legs walking together so you connect them together to earth platforms, um, you start making aircraft simulators, vehicle simulators. Um, some medical appliances based on this. So these parallel manipulators, they are much stiffer and stronger, but have limited workspace. But you can make stiff and strong robots 
okay, which large force carrying ability and can be fairly precise, but have limited workspace. So <clears throat> they are used for application requiring rigidity, building simulators and then tool heads for medical applications, contouring, local drilling and things like that. Then you come to humanoid robots. These emerged. So this is ASIMO. You can see in big bold letters here. You have football playing robots. You have these pet dogs. Okay, and really Japanese fancy. I mean, the Japanese are very technology oriented societies. You know, they kind of want the latest gizmos and are willing to pay for it. You know, they are not so much into lying in the beach in with the money. You know, they they kind of like they like neat things. So they always push technology and it's it's gone far. I mean this is this is old. I mean this is about a decade old. Okay, but you start making these kind of things and you start wondering, can I have football playing with robots walking around and like a dog? You know, why do I want something which wags his tail and then also uh, poops in the street? Get a robot to come along. And so one of the areas where people got technology or human beings to uh, do things um, is through teleoperations. Like you send a Mars rover. Right? So if you don't have enough artificial intelligence which you can pack into the device, right? it's okay, fine, I'll have a human being control it, control it from here. So for a long time there was this big debate you know, as to whether as to how much we need to do in terms of all these methods, in terms of responses, you know, trying to make things more autonomous. So there was actually a stall. There was a period of time when robotic research had stalled because there was no funding available. People said, okay, we have seen the ASV, we know what it can do. So fine, you know, all of this is fine. This is not working, that's not working. So funding had dried up, but then slowly it picked up again because people realized that you, know, you don't have solutions for everything. So, for example, between Earth and the Mars, the time delay is six seconds. Right? If you're doing telesurgery, people talk about telesurgery, you know, operating in African village from US, you know, to get the tech medical skills into the remote areas. You do that over the internet, you're going to have delays. Okay, unless you buy your dedicated satellite link and go up there and come there, even then you'll have some delays. So the, you know, you have to still work on these problems of, you know, trying to control tremor and all these kind of things across the net. So time delays, you know, through teleoperation is a big area. There are problems to be solved there. But you always need some level of autonomy. You cannot do it with saying that I'll have always a human being as operator controlling it if I'm in a remote environment. So over the last two decades, People have, you know, stepped down. They said, human beings are fine, but let's also go and look at some other animals. Okay. And animals are really remarkably well adapted. They're very little overheads, right? You'll not see an animal wearing a jacket. They survive in the cold, in the heat. No air conditioning. Well, they like air conditioning. If you have a dog and then you have an air conditioned room in the summer, it'll go in there. If it's heated, it'll go in there. They like it, but they survive. And they're very efficient and very, very flexible in their operation. You know, you can feed a cockroach, you know, bread, and then after some time, just switch it to having cheese, it'll survive fine. You know, it's not a problem. And here, people who come from the south, if you give them rotis, they have a problem. You know, so that is the adaptability. So, so there are issues there. You know, they're very robust and uh, they're very contingent. I mean, robust to contingency. They handle things, damages. I mean, take a millipede break of a leg, who cares? Even a dog with one limp leg can do fairly well. Okay, so, so these are phenomena which you want to look at. And people started building little devices like this. So somebody deliberately put in matchsticks. And these are... Uh, a set of uh, sonars to do the imaging and you put it together. So there is then this robot 3. It's basically mo modeled on a 
bulbarous cockroach. 24 degrees of freedom all through and then actuated by pneumatic cylinders of the shelf. Uh, but the power, pressure, as air and control are all off board. So they are not on board. So things are removed. So this is about 30 pounds. You make wings. <coughs> Three inches long, can move up to 10 body lengths per second and then it has this uh, leg structure so it can move on surfaces and then if it has a higher step to be taken so there's this leg here so this leg will catch and then it can climb over them also. Okay. So these are all I mean see each one of these uh, devices kind of has been used earlier. So now people started putting them together to make small things and independent things, okay. And finally, so let us see, hopefully, we implemented an autonomous controller capable of recovering from extreme initial conditions. So it's throwing it, it's recovering. So this is a quad rotor, okay. So it is four rotors. This is the University of Pennsylvania. We can precisely track trajectories with large accelerations and velocities. Throw up a hoop, it's flying through it. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, um, <coughs> so here there are so if you think of this technology, so there is this basic technology in which you have the rotors and then you have a system which is capable of adapting or flying like that, number one, of being able to manipulate. Now that, let us say that's available to you. The robotics question then is how do I make it fly through a hoop? That means I must have that level of control over the system. Okay. So that is a robotics problem. The other one is a fluid dynamics problem, is a aeronautical problem. So there is always a robotics problem which is around. So, for example, there are a bunch of people who are trying to make table tennis playing robots. Okay, the idea is that you make it learn motor skills like human beings. And the methods is that you slowly train the robot, slowly and slowly become better and better at it. So, you have a camera and you have an agile arm. And now they are making progress. Well, there was one build many years ago, though. Robotics playing machine, uh, uh, maybe 15 years ago. But that is based on technology which is not, uh, I mean, quote unquote, correct. Somebody built one, but it's not correct. So now they're doing it using technologies by which can be generalized to essentially learn motor skills of human-like motor skills. Okay. So, so what is next? We don't know, right? So there are people doing some research all over the place. So we are typically 20 years, 15 years behind in robotics the, of Japan and the US. Okay, I'm also partially responsible for that because I once was state of the art and then over time, uh, but we are trying to make amends, right? We have combined, I mean, in IIT Delhi, we have combined electrical computer science and mechanical into a single lab now, which is going to come up in the year. It's already starting to come up. So which is what you need to do to do some of this research. So instead of someone like me who knows a little bit of, I mean, some mechanical engineering, a little bit of electrical, some computer science, trying to build these things up from scratch, if you can combine, like the UPenn Grasp Lab, that's actually a multidisciplinary kind of area. So you need to do that to get a real output like this, of the kind which I showed you in the end, or the, some of the earlier ones. 
So <clears throat> that is what is in the offering. Now in this course, we will focus on the mathematical modeling of these systems. We will not focus on buildings, for example, the quadrotor. Okay. Well, that is a different issue, and uh, or building a new robot, of or, or building a new manipulator. But we will see what are the method, mathematical methods which are used, which can you know later on help you design and develop these new class of systems, which we are talking about. How to generalize, how to understand the relationship between force and motion in 3D, and these kind of responses. Okay. So this is where I want to end today. And we will uh, uh, take off on the next class by uh, looking at lines in space and then derive, uh, look at, derive what is very conventional on the Denavit and Hartenberg parameters so that uh, we get understanding of space and how to map, do forward and inverse kinematics of the kind that I was talking about. Okay. All right. So I'll see you next Tuesday.